design patterns in the cloud. Cloud migration. In this video, we are going to discuss and analyze how each component of our application stack is going to fit into the big picture of the cloud. Think of our sample application as a legacy system, which is in the process of migrating to a microservice architecture into the cloud, but which isn't quite there just yet and needs some or more like a lot of attention. Finally, we will summarize which part of our currently on-premise application stack will be migrated to an infrastructure, platform or software as a service model. By the end, you will get a clear picture of what kind of considerations to take into account before or during migrating an application to the cloud. Let's start. Imagine that your boss is considering to move the company's imaginary application stack to the cloud. The possible reasons for this could be the following. The customers having trouble accessing centralized resources because of network failures caused by an unreliable ISP, for example or database dumps taking too long, creating a delay in query and response times because there is just not enough raw power in the on-premise machine or machines handling requests, or redundant storages are failing again because the RAID controllers both the other day fried out for some unknown reason the company doesn't have the resources to investigate right now. The tech guy is on holiday, of course, and will be available next week only, so until then, no redundancy for customer data. And there could be several hundred other scenarios as well, which would legitimize cloud migration efforts. Whatever the reasons are, we'll be the ones responsible for the migration and every design decision on the way, obviously. First, we will need to know what kind of functionality we would like to deploy to the cloud and what kind of services we will need for that. So let's take a look. First, let's start our system with all of its bells and whistles. Our main application consists of a command line interface and a web interface, which can start together by running a single main class. This is a problem. Two different presentation layers are coupled into one package, won't work in the cloud, as this is a rather peculiar solution. It is okay for a smallish scale application, which we have started off with, but it's not scalable. So we will split up the presentation layers. The web interface will live and execute inside the cloud. The command line client should run on the client's machines. Running it in the cloud would be pointless since end users shouldn't be exposed to cloud infrastructure directly. What will be more useful is running a command line client on an end user's machine and having it connect to the cloud instead. Our first note here for ourselves is that we will need to deploy the web interface to the cloud so that users could access it and we should allow the users of the command line interface to run the application on their machines and access the cloud indirectly in the background. Our second note is to make the web interface easily deployable to the cloud and other infrastructures as well. In order to do that, we will make a web application archive or WAR file out of it. Okay, let's continue our review. When we list products, the app fetches data from the warehouse's database. So the application will need to have access to a database somehow. Right now, the app accesses a local database running on the same machine as the web or the CLI apps. For ease of demonstrations, this was an H2 in-memory database, but it could have been a local MySQL installation or a centralized database server on a server machine as well. What's important here is that the interfaces access the same database, and this is crucial. If we were to add a product in the web interface and list products again in the command line interface, the new product would show up in the terminal. Hence, the two applications are connected behind the scenes by the same database. Our current configuration won't work too well in the cloud since the H2 in-memory database can be accessed only from the JVM process it was started from. As we are going to split up the web and CLI interfaces into two separate programs, this won't work since each app will see a different in-memory database. The web interface will execute in a JVM inside the cloud. The command line interface will execute on the end users' machines and it will connect to the cloud. 
it would be possible by quirky workarounds to make the H2 in-memory database accessible running inside the web interface's JVM process, but it isn't worth the effort. Please note that this issue only needs our attention because the samples were built with ease of execution on your, the viewer's machine in mind. In a real-world business application, this particular problem would rarely manifest itself. However, the solution to this problem is one generic and important enough to be discussed and stressed. So, our third note to ourselves is, we will need a database, preferably in the cloud, that both of our applications could connect to. Okay, what else is there? Let's list our customers. Customer data is provided by microservice, which ran as a separate process and provides an HTTP interface the CLI and web classes connect to. Our fourth note is we must make this service available either in the cloud or run it somewhere else and make it available for processes running in the cloud to connect to. For now, we will start it locally. As the microservice that provides the presentation layer with customer data is actually a facade that hides the fact that the microservice combines data fetched from its database and from an external API, we must also have a stateful data storage for the microservice as well and have an external API from where we can fetch users from. We will need to provide a similar API to the microservice that either resides on the cloud or somewhere else. Thus, our fifth note is that we will need to provide the microservices with a separate database of its own. And the sixth note is that we will need to provide it with access to our third-party customer API. There is also a feature which delivers exported reports via email as well. Let's go to settings. First, we need to enable this feature since it's disabled by default. Let's do an export. Since the SMTP server we have used for testing email sending isn't running, we get this error. Our seventh note is we should have an SMTP service in the cloud or somewhere else we can connect to from the cloud so that we can deliver emails with. There is also an option to deliver reports into a directory instead of sending them by email. To access the feature, we must change the setting. Switch to file-based report delivery. Let's do an export. By default, reports are saved in the project's current working directory. This works great in the command line interface since, as we have discussed, this executes on the machine of end users. The report will be saved whatever is their working directory at the moment when they start the application. There is a problem, however, when we deploy our application to the cloud and try to access this feature from the web interface. In the cloud, the working directory of the application might not be accessible or not easily. Moreover, end users won't and shouldn't have access to this since this is part of the cloud infrastructure itself. The solution is to save to a shared directory in the cloud to which end users have access to because we explicitly give them access to those shared directories. So our final and eighth note for ourselves is allow the CLI and the web interfaces to deliver reports to directories somewhat differently than previously. There is also a chart image export feature which creates PNG out of exports, but we 
need not do anything about this since it should work without problem in both the CLI and web interfaces. In the CLI, the generated images are in the user's working directory. Using the web interface, the images are embedded into the pages of the web interface. So this will just work if we are able to host the application in the cloud or somewhere else. In the process of migrating to the cloud, you must also weigh options about where and how to run stuff. First, how much you want to manage what happens in the little slice of the cloud you're about to rent from a provider. Would you like to manage everything on physical or virtual machines, like installing uh, operating systems yourself, updating language runtimes like Java, running services like Apache, Tomcat, handling restarts, deploying new versions with specific tools? If the answer is yes, you should look for an infrastructure as a service provider or IaaS which can help in mimicking exactly what you might have in an on-premise setup. Just it will be in the cloud like a virtual data center. In a setup like this, you won't have to worry about problems like failing redundant storage because service providers cover you on this and other hardware related fronts. The upside is that you get a lot of flexibility with IaaS, but you still have to manage a lot of things like virtual machine provisioning, for example, or container management and orchestration. If you really would like to forget about the stuff about installing and managing different database versions on your machines and just want to deploy your code and make someone use it, then a platform as a service or PaaS model might be the right choice. With services based on this model, you really need to have an application and that's it, you can deploy it. The not so obvious downside is that whatever language runtime and version the PaaS provider makes available to you is the one you have to stick to resulting in more rigid constraints. For example, if you would like to migrate your application to the newest Java version, for example, but your PaaS provider doesn't support this version yet, you just can't do this. The upside to this, you will have a lot less to manage with a PaaS provider providing the platform for you. Finally, there is also the software as a service or SaaS model. In this model, you as the developer, are a subscriber to a service that you can use as is. You have no ability to create a new application on top of the service by supplying uploading code to it. But you can consume it through other services, be that on-premise IaaS or PaaS service. An example would be an online cloud storage provider. You can upload and download files via a browser after you subscribe to the service, but you cannot change how the service works under the hood by writing some clever code. For example, you won't be able to influence how the files are stored in the cloud or from where they will be downloaded and stuff like that. As a developer, you could access, however, the upload and download functionality to such a service programmatically. But the code you build like this lies outside of the boundaries of a software as a service product and you have to manage this yourself. Also, great care must be taken not to get logged into such a service. If you couple your code against a service and its API, and if there is only a single provider supporting this API and no other, you will have a hard time migrating from such a service. You may ask, why would you want to do that? Well, think about the subscription fees of a service you're logged into already going up significantly. Switching to other such cheaper services, if there are no such services like that, or only other services using slightly different APIs will make your life harder as you will need to rewrite a part of your own code base to migrate. For our own migration to the cloud, we will rely on all three of these models, mostly the platform and software as a service models for ease of use with occasional use of the infrastructure as a service model for its flexibility. So as to summarize, here's what we are going to do. Deploy the web interface to the cloud on a PaaS solution that provides runtime for Java web applications. We will need to make sure that the application is standard and deployable as a web application archive or WAR. We will create a database in the cloud shared by the command line and web clients, 
Most cloud providers provide RDBM systems in a software as a service way for this purpose. We will need to deploy the customer API microservice facade to the cloud, similarly to the web interface as a web archive. We will need to create a separate database in the cloud for the microservice application too, just like for the main app. We will deploy or make accessible third-party customer data gateway for the microservice. By relying on cloud providers' built-in identity user management facilities, we won't be actually needed to deploy anything, only configure the rest of the system to have access to these facilities. We will deploy an SMTP service for email delivery, leveraging containerization. Finally, we need to create a shared cloud storage to store exported reports to which end users of our applications will have access to.